Okay, uh, welcome to Geotechnical Engineering Design. This is um, a presentation to, to study a problem based on the, on the exercise uh, called Unproped Wall. And this is related with the previous video where the previous video where the theory was discussed regarding the same topic. So, as we saw before, the case we are going to study is um, a very simple case without a water table. So we don't have any water pressure, then we are going to work in total stresses. So there is no, uh, in this case, the total stress will be equal to the effective stress because there is no water pressure. And in this case, we are going to do a numerical exercise. So we have the same unproped wall as in the theory in the previous video. In this case, the uh, HH is equal to 6 meters and the distance um, that the, this wall is inserted in the ground is 10 meters. Um, the load Q on the ground to the left side of the, of the wall is 10 kN per square meter. Uh, the soil is a sand with a dry uh, unit weight of 19 kN per cubic meter and an angle of internal friction of 40 degrees. So in the first place, you will notice that the distance you have to insert a wall when it's unproped is considerably because you need to ensure that you have enough passive pressure to the right side of the wall to keep the wall in equilibrium, the wall which is under active pressure to the left side of the wall. So in the first place, we have to discuss what the Euro code 7 tell about uh, these structures. And it's very simple to consider just a few things because the, in the first place, the Euro codes said, uh, says that the design approach one and combination two are the appropriate design approach and appropriate combination for dealing with geotechnical problems. So this is the, in general, the case we are going to, to use to increase the actions and to reduce some properties of the soils in order to have a better safety factor or a better sense of safety in terms of our calculations. So the design approach one and combination two um, establish the, the variable A2 for actions R1 for resistances and M2 for material properties. This means that for action we are going to use the second column of this table. For materials, we're going to use the second column of this table, and for resistances, we're going to use the first column. In terms of resistances, we need to notice that uh, for geotechnical problems, the column, the first column for R1, which is for design approach one, combination two, all the coefficients are equal to one, so they, there won't be any change in terms of resistances in the calculation of our problems. But for the case of the actions, for example, if you study the, the coefficients, for permanent and favorable action, we have a coefficient equal to 1, so no changes. For permanent favorable action, we have a coefficient equal to 1, so no changes. For every variable favorable action, we have to apply a coefficient of 0, so we are not taking into account any variable favorable action because they are not permanent, so there is no point of taking into account these kind of actions uh, to calculate our safety factor. And for variable and favorable actions, which is the case for our Q in this problem, the, the load we have on top of the ground next to the, to the wall, the coefficient will 1.30. So we are going to increase the action in 30% just to have a, a, a better, um, to be farther from, from, from failure, if you want to think in this way. In terms of material properties, the column uh, proposed uh, a coefficient of 1.25 for, uh, for um, for the tangent of uh, the angle of internal friction, 1.25 for, for the cohesion, so 25% of reduction of these uh, properties. Um, establish a 40% of um, reduction of the undrained shear strength SU, and a coefficient equal to one for the unit weight. So basically we don't change the unit weight in any case. Um, then, if we go back to our problem, in the first place we have to reduce uh, following the Euro codes, the angle of internal friction. Originally, we have an angle of internal friction of 40 degrees, and there is a funny um, things about the way we have to calculate the angle of internal friction because it's referred to the tangent and not to the angle directly. 
So we have to divide by 1.25 the tangent of the angle 40 degrees in this case to get the tangent of the new uh, reduced angle of internal friction and then applying the inverse of the tangent we uh, arrive to the conclusion that the new angle of internal friction will be 34 degrees. So there is a considerable reduction of 6 degrees in this property for this sand. So we are going to change that value to 34, and this is the value we're going to use in our calculations. The Euro code proposed a 30% of um, in increments in the value of the Q because it's an, an, it's, this is unfavorable variable load. So a 30% of increase uh, represent, uh, we go to a Q prime to 13 kilonewton per square meter. So we are correcting here. So we have a new angle, a new Q now. And there is another thing. Um, there, is a, there are certain advices from the good practice uh, based on many, many years of experience uh, doing these calculations. And um, experimented engineers um, have defined this good practice to reduce the actual distance we have at the wall inserted in the ground with this factor of uh, 5 over 6. And, and basically we reduce this 10 meter we have for this particular problem to 8.33 meters. With this reduction, we are redu re reducing all the distances that produce moments, and we are going to, to be uh, far from failure, let's say, uh, because we are in, in worse condition than in reality. So the, the, in reality, the wall will be inserted deeper in the ground, which will be beneficial for our safety factor. So it's a good practice and it's, a, it's an advice that is, is good to follow in our calculations. And this is what we are going to do. So we are going to change this distance. We are going to call now D prime 8.33 meters. So we have chain Q to Q prime uh, equal to 13 kilonewton per square meter. And we have a new angle of internal friction phi prime equal to 34 degrees. So in the first place, what we have to do when we have these problems is to calculate the values for the angle, the coefficient of active pressure and coefficient of passive pressure. They have these formulas, which are um, relatively simple. So we have to uh, replace the angles for the value of the reduced angle, and we get a 0 0.28 for the coefficient of active pressure and 3.54 for the angle of, uh, for the coefficient of passive pressure. Sorry. So, having the coefficients and having all the data from this problem, we can start um, doing the diagrams. So, in the first place, we are going to have this rectangular diagram that represents the active pressure produced by Q prime in this case. So, it's the coefficient of active pressure multiplied by Q prime. The base of this triangle that represents the pressure of the ground, the self weight of the ground, is the coefficient of active pressure times gamma, which is 19. No changes for that. Uh, multiplied by h plus this prime is the reduced distance we have uh, using because they could practice. So this is the active pressure of our problem. The passive pressure will be to the right side of the structure. And we are going to establish this value in equilibrium and for the case of the maximum passive pressure as well. So the total uh, height of this wall is 14.33 with the summation of these two values. And if we replace the values, the base of this rectangle is 0 0.28 times 13, which is 3.64 kilonewton per square meter. The base of this triangle is 0 0.28, the coefficient of active pressure multiplied by 19, the unit weight, multiplied by the height, 14.33, equal to 76 kilonewton per square meter. So this is the active pressure again, this is the passive pressure. So if we are looking for the forces, the forces will be located, remember, in the very center of these two triangles and the very center of this rectangle. And the mechanism is rotation around a point A at the bottom of the wall. This is the mechanism of failure of this wall. So we have to evaluate moments around this point then. And in order to do that, we need the distances from the forces that are the, the active pressure and the forces which represent the passive pressure to the right. And these are the distances, all refer to the new distance d prime we have reduced. And if we replace by numbers, we have the distances 7.17, 4.78, and 
eight meters for this distance from the passive pressure to the point A. So we have to do the equilibrium of moments. So if we write this equation, the equilibrium of the moments of PA1, PA2, positive both, minus the moment of PP, has to be equal to zero. And this PP will be the passive pressure in equilibrium, in equilibrium based on moments, summation of moments. We can calculate as well the values of PA1 and PA2, replacing the values in these formulas, which are basically the areas of this rectangle and the area of this triangle in blue. So uh, I have replaced the distances in this equation. And after we calculate the values of the active pressure because the Q prime and because the self weight of the soil, and replacing these values in the formula for the passive pressure in equilibrium, we reach this value of 1073 kilonewton of passive pressure in equilibrium. After that, we can calculate the maximum passive pressure that this soil can develop, which is equal to the area of this triangle in red in here, and the base is the coefficient of passive pressure multiplied by unit weight multiplied by D prime. So if we replace by values, and we multiply by the height and divided by two because it's the area of this triangle in red, we reach this value, or we determine this value of 2,334 kilonewton as the maximum passive pressure. So a priori, you can see that the maximum passive pressure is greater than the passive pressure in equilibrium. So this is a good thing because we are going to have good conditions because uh, we have more passive pressure than we need uh, in equilibrium. If we do the calculation of a safety factor based on these two values, we find that this safety factor in this case is 2.18, which is a safety factor greater than one in principle. Uh, how good is this safety factor will depend on the uh, how danger is the situation or, or what is the activity that is being done around this uh, this wall. If this is um, a variable, uh, to say it's, it's not it's a non-permanent structure, maybe this is this um, safety factor is enough. But if this structure is permanent, maybe this safety factor is smaller, and we need to improve the design of this wall in order to get a better safety factor, let's say, around three or four. Sometimes what happens is that um, our uh, customers um, define a safety factor, a decidable safety factor for the structure, so we need to redesign the structure until we get the safety factor that was contracted uh, when uh, we were contracted for doing this, this job. Again, remember, if you have a safety factor after your calculations equal to one, you immediately, and if this is an, 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 an structure that is constructed already, you have to reinforce immediately to avoid any failure. If the safety factor is minor than one, you reinforce and you run because this is about to fail. Thank you very much. I hope this uh, video was useful for you to understand the theory and the mechanism for unproped walls and the calculation for a simple problem where a wall is inserted in sand. Thank you very much.